Hello students, this is Professor Boyer, and in this lecture I will be covering Aristotle's Action Theory, which is found in Nicomachean Ethics, Book 3, Chapters 1 through 5. So Action Theory refers to the study of human actions, in particular voluntary actions. So the idea of voluntary actions is important for ethics is because we want to distinguish between voluntary actions, which we hold to be moral, from non-voluntary actions, which we hold to be non-moral. And this is important because we judge people by voluntary actions. If an action is good and it's voluntary, then we say it makes you good and makes you virtuous. If there's an action which is bad and voluntary, we say that the action is bad and it makes you wicked. If you perform an action involuntarily, even if it's an action that is bad, we don't blame you for it. So to understand the idea of how do we develop virtue, since virtue is developed by performing certain types of actions, you only actually develop the virtue if you choose to perform these actions. So let's turn to Aristotle's examination of voluntary and involuntary actions to set the stage for understanding his theory of moral responsibility. So Aristotle's definition of virtue, as we saw in our previous lecture, involves choice. And since we want to understand virtue in order that we can understand our ultimate end of happiness, we need to look at what choice is and what defines an action that has choice or that is voluntary, that comes from our will, our voluntas, to use the Latin. So Aristotle gives us an initial criterion. He says voluntary actions are ones that deserve praise or blame. Involuntary actions, if they're moral or harmful, deserve pardon or pity. So in this light, this is not a proper definition of voluntary versus involuntary, but rather an indication that we can use in our examination. So Aristotle then uses this idea of praise and blame, in the case of voluntary, and pardon and pity, because of involuntary actions that are bad, in order to consider what kind of actions might be called involuntary. And he gives us two types, actions done under constraint and actions that are due to ignorance. Let's consider involuntary actions due to constraint first. So how should we define an action that's due to constraint? So an action due to constraint, Aristotle thinks, would be one of the following sorts. Uh, one case would be being blown by the wind. If you're walking down the street and suddenly a gigantic gust of wind comes up and blows you about and you move down the block, are you voluntarily moving down the block or involuntarily? You would say you're involuntarily moving down the block. Another case is where you do something that goes against your desire, that you would rather not do it, but nonetheless, on the situation, you do choose to do it. So throwing luggage overboard on a sinking ship. You want to get rid of excess weight in order that the ship won't sink. So you throw your luggage overboard. But that's something that really goes against what you want. You don't want to lose your luggage. A third example, Aristotle talks about doing something under constraint and doing an action which is considered immoral or wicked. So for example, killing an innocent because a terrorist demands that you do so. So the problem that Aristotle faces, or the question that we need to consider is, are all of these actions truly involuntary? How do we distinguish actions that are due to constraint that are fully involuntary and therefore don't affect your, um, your moral character, and which also do not uh, fall under morality, and those which, although there might be some constraints, are not fully due to constraint, and therefore you do have some choice, and therefore you are a moral agent when performing them. So Aristotle then gives us a definition of constraint. An act is done under constraint when the initiative or source of motion comes from without. It is the kind of act in which the agent or the person acted upon contributes nothing. This definition is later taken up, this concept is later taken up by say, Thomas Aquinas in his treatment of free will. So what does Aristotle mean by this definition? Let's break it down. He first says an act is done under constraint when the initiative or source of motion comes from without. So what he is saying is that when some activity is performed or when some activity occurs and you're involved, if you do not initiate the motion or 
you are not the cause of the activity, then the cause is external to you. The source of motion or initiative comes from without. It is outside of you. And to make clear that this is this does not count cases where a situation might be imposed on you, but you can still choose how to respond, he then adds, an action done under constraint is the kind of act in which the agent or person acted upon contributes nothing. So an action is fully done under constraint and therefore is completely involuntary if you are not a cause at all of the activity that is associated with you. If, for example, you walk down the street and you trip, and when you trip, you bump into somebody, we say that the tripping was not caused by you, and because it was not caused by you, it would seem to be that you did not contribute to the bumping into the person. And since you did not contribute something there, you are not responsible. You would say it's an accident. On the other hand, if you should have been looking where you're going, you might be responsible, but that gets into actions involving ignorance, which we'll treat next. But let's distinguish the different types of constraint using our examples earlier. So let's look at whether or not you're responsible for the three examples Aristotle considered. The first example where there's a large gust of wind and it blows you about, a rather fantastical example, but let's go back to the tripping example. Let's say there's a large gust of wind and it blows you into somebody else. You bump that person, they spill coffee on their shirt and get burned. Are you responsible for that person being burned? Because you bumped that person because the wind blew you, Aristotle says no. It's a completely involuntary action because you did not cause the situation. That is, you did not cause the wind to blow you. You did not choose to have a gigantic wind machine blowing upon you. And you also didn't contribute anything to the action. You weren't assisting in the motion that the wind impelled in you. However, in the cases of throwing luggage overboard and giving in to a terrorist demands, Aristotle calls these mixed actions. He says they are involuntary insofar as the circumstances you find yourself in may not have been chosen by you. You did not do anything to put yourself in this circumstance or you are not responsible for the circumstance that you find yourself in. If you're at sea, Although you might be responsible, let's say you're not responsible for the boat sinking and for the need to throw weight overboard. Since you're not responsible for the need to throw weight overboard, it's involuntary insofar as you didn't get yourself into the situation. However, once you see that the boat is sinking, you have a choice how to react. You can either hold on to your luggage or you can chuck it over the side into the water, never to see it again, and consign it to the, to the briny depths. In this case, Aristotle would say that the action is voluntary in the circumstances. Although you didn't bring the sinking boat upon yourself, you can choose how to react, and because you can choose to how, how to react, we say that you are responsible for, you are the cause of the luggage going overboard. And since you are the cause of luggage going overboard, he says, it is therefore not fully involuntary. Aristotle says that that kind of action is involuntary in itself as far as no one would choose to throw their luggage overboard, their nice luggage overboard, under normal circumstances. But when a circumstance such as the boat sinking happens to you, you do do so. In the case of killing the innocent due to a terrorist demanding, the terrorist says, if you, unless you murder this person, I'm going to nuke all of Houston. In that case, just as in the case of the sinking ship, Aristotle would say that it's involuntary insofar as you did not cause the situation where the terrorist has compelled you to do this. If you did put yourself in a situation where you, where you, find, uh, where you find a terrorist threatening you, and you should have known better, we might say you were partly to blame, in a way, but insofar as you did not force these demands upon yourself, you're not responsible for that situation. However, and this is important, although you didn't choose 
to have the terrorist force this situation on you. Nonetheless, you have the power to determine how you will react. And because you have the power to determine how to react, if you kill an innocent because the terrorist is demanding it of you, the killing of the innocent is caused by you. The terrorist isn't coming over and putting a gun in your hand and forcing your figure to pull the trigger. That would be a fully involuntary action. Rather, you choose to go along with the terrorist demands if you do kill the innocent. And because you can choose whether or not to comply, it's in your power to resist, Aristotle thinks that that is a voluntary action because under the circumstances you are in control of how you react. Now, Aristotle says that in such cases we should not comply with the terrorists because that is an immoral action and we should rather die than do something that bad. Although he does acknowledge that there may be certain circumstances that are just too stressful or too much for any one person to bear. For example, if someone is being tortured for information for hours and hours and days and days and eventually they break and they give up the information, I don't think we would say that they were being immoral, rather they just got to a point at which they just no longer could physically resist. In that case, Aristotle says, it ceases to be voluntary and becomes involuntary and is something that we should pity. But in such a circumstance, which is rare, Aristotle says it's because it's because you are put past the point of having control of how you will react. If your instincts kick in and you just blurt out the information in order to avoid any further pain, then he would say that because you didn't choose to, it was instinctual, therefore it was involuntary. Nevertheless, there are some actions, he says, that we should rather die than perform. So he is maintaining his objective, realist theory of ethics in these cases, and not saying, well, the circumstances change everything, like the consequentialists would hold. All right, let's turn to actions due to ignorance. So we would distinguish between two types, <clears throat> two types of actions here, involuntary versus non-voluntary. So in the case of, um, in the case of uh, actions due to compulsion or force, we say that an action is non-voluntary when you do not contribute any anything to the action. You do not cause it in any way, and it's voluntary if you are a cause. Aristotle, in the case of ignorance, distinguishes it in this way. He says, a non-voluntary action is not the result of your choice. That is, you didn't intend the particular thing to happen that happened. You might have chosen to perform the action you performed, but you didn't know it would have the consequences it had. You didn't know the circumstances under which it was performed. And had you known, you wouldn't have done it. If that's the case, we say that the action is involuntary. The action is not the result of your conscious choice, and the actual activity, had you known, is contrary to what you would have desired or willed if you were not ignorant. If it's involuntary, you regret that you performed the action, and your regret is a sign that it's involuntary. However, if you do not know what is going on, you perform the action, and afterwards, you don't regret the action being performed, we would call that non-voluntary. It's non-voluntary because it doesn't involve your will, but it's not contrary to your will or your desire, as an involuntary action is. Aristotle, however, wants to make an important qualification here. Just because ignorance might lead you to perform an action that you wouldn't want to perform, doesn't mean that you're not culpable. This is why he brings up the distinction between actions due to ignorance and actions that are done in ignorance. An action due to ignorance is an action where you perform it because you don't know, but you are responsible for not knowing. These actions are moral actions insofar as you are responsible for the circumstances of your ignorance. So a classic example would be somebody who gets terribly drunk. And the drunk man does not understand fully what he's doing. 
he goes out and he drives a car, and he doesn't have very good awareness of what's going on, and he ends up running over a pedestrian. Now, he might have been ignorant that there was a pedestrian walking on the sidewalk and that he was having, he happened to be driving on the sidewalk, but the reason why he was driving on the sidewalk was because he was ignorant of the circumstances, and he was ignorant because he chose to get drunk. So if you're responsible for being in a state of ignorance, then Aristotle says you are responsible for that action. Another case would be if you choose not to look into the details, if you voluntarily choose to ignore any, uh, uh, ignore the opportunity to figure out what's going on. Let's say you go hunting, and you take out your gun and you shoot your gun, with and you choose not to look around to see if there's any other hunters around, and you hit another hunter, you're responsible for that because you had an obligation to make sure that there was nobody else in your line of fire. On the other hand, actions done in ignorance are cases where you are not culpable for your ignorance. You did not cause your ignorance, either by making yourself in a state where you couldn't know what was going on, such as voluntarily getting drunk, or cases where even though you aren't drunk or besotted or out of it, nevertheless there's no way you could have known the consequences of your action. These actions, Aristotle says, are non-moral. That is, they are neither good nor bad. They don't make you a good person or a bad person. They don't affect your character because they don't involve a habitual choice to act in a certain way. Because as we recall, the definition of virtue involves choice. So involuntary actions due to ignorance, I'm sorry, uh, done in ignorance, um, uh, will have six circumstances about which you can be ignorant. Uh, the six relevant circumstances whereby we evaluate an action, these will also be important for determining whether an action is moral or immoral, are who the agent is, what kind of action is being performed, what thing or person is being acted on by the agent, the means that the agent is using, the consequences or outcome of the action, and the manner in which the action is performed. Now, Aristotle doesn't think that you can ever be ignorant of who the agent is when you act. You know that it is you who is doing the action. So therefore, you can't claim ignorance of who is acting, right? However, you can be ignorant about what action you were performing, what thing or person you were affecting, what tool you are using to perform the action, what the outcome of the action is, or the way that you're performing the action. Now, <clears throat> he says that you might think, for example, that when you pour some uh, some liquid on the car, you think it's water, you're washing the car, but it's actually sulfuric acid. So the action is not an action of washing, but of burning. In this case, you didn't realize that it was burning because you were ignorant of the kind of action being done. Now that's due both to an ignorance of number two and an ignorance of number four. You don't recognize what it is that you are using. Aristotle also gives the example of throwing a stone somebody and you assume it's a light pumice stone, a very light stone, but actually it's a very heavy stone. I don't know how you could be unaware of the weight of the stone you, you have, but nonetheless. And <clears throat> you try to get someone's attention by throwing a little thing and you hit them with this heavy stone and they get hurt. You didn't know that this was a heavy stone that would hurt them, so in that case had you known you wouldn't perform the action. Likewise, you might not know what is being acted upon. So to take a rather uh, a rather benign example, you're walking uh, you walk into uh, you walk into uh, the grocery store, and you see somebody and you think you know them, so you say hello, how's it going? And they turn around and you realize you don't know who it is. In that case, you are acting you're acting in ignorance of who you were talking to. You thought it was your friend, but it was not. Likewise, in a more serious case. Uh, you see someone who was rude to you before, and you yell something rude back at them. And then you realize that it's not the person you thought it was. In that case, you were acting in ignorance. Now, one of the most common ones is the outcomes of your action. You might not realize what outcomes or what co the consequences of an action are. 
especially if there are circumstances you're not aware of which affect or change what the normal outcome of an action is. Lastly, he says the way that you perform an action. You might intend, for example, just to give somebody a, a gentle hug but actually crush them. You might intend to, to just cook some food very gently and, actually, and accidentally burn it. So you might not know the way that an action is being performed. If you are ignorant of two through six, he says you are acting in ignorance. All right. Now that we've distinguished voluntary actions from involuntary actions by showing how involuntary actions either involve one, not knowing what you're doing, such that if you did know, you wouldn't perform the action, and two, not being responsible in any way for the action performed, let's turn to voluntary actions and what is the hallmark of voluntary action that is choice. Now, voluntary actions are defined by choice, but it's not exactly clear on first blush what choice is. What is a choice? Now, there's several possibilities that Aristotle considers. Could a choice be a kind of appetite or desire? Could our choices be defined by our emotions? Could our choices be defined by our wishes? Or could our choices be defined by our opinions? Because as we recall, virtue is a habit concerning choice. It's a habit that arises from choosing to act in certain ways. So if our opinions are what define our choices, then our opinions will be what makes us virtuous or vicious. If our emotions are what define our choices, then our emotions will be make us virtuous and vicious. If our appetites fine, etc., etc. Aristotle thinks that none of these, not appetite, emotion, wish, or opinion, are what constitute choice. He says choice is not an appetite or emotion because we can voluntarily ignore our appetites and emotions. So although our appetites and emotions might motivate us or drive us to choose, or we might feel certain motivations, that is appetites or emotions, when we choose, nonetheless, they're not the same. Choice is distinct. We can choose to go along with our emotions, or we can choose to ignore them. And because we can go either way, it, that recognizes that our power to choose is not the same as our emotions or appetites. Furthermore, choice is not the same as our general desires or wishes. We desire or wish for things that we cannot necessarily accomplish ourselves. For example, if I wish the Astros to win the World Series, that's fine, but I can't do anything to, uh, to help them win the World Series. That's beyond my power. So we wouldn't call something that we desire voluntary, just because desire is involved. Something further must be involved besides just a general desire. And last, he says, choice is not an opinion. That is, our opinions, our beliefs, are not what make us virtuous. Merely having good opinions or believing the right things doesn't make you a good person because we can have opinions but not act on them. I think this is far too common and, and most of us probably have experienced this where we do something that we knew we shouldn't have done or we do something even though when we reflect on it we didn't really think it was a good idea but we did it anyway. In those cases we acted contrary to our beliefs and if we act contrary to our beliefs and we do so voluntarily that shows our choices are not the same as our opinions. But if Aristotle is right that voluntariness is defined by choice, and choice is what determines our moral character, you can't be a good person just because you believe the right things. You have to choose to act on those beliefs. Otherwise, your beliefs are rather pointless. So Aristotle concludes this initial examination of choice. He will come back and define choice a little bit later by saying that it seems that choice follows upon deliberation that is we think about what's the best way to act and upon figuring out what we think is the best way to act we then decide to follow this opinion that we have formed. And before we continue 
I just want to make a brief comment about the structure of Aristotle's investigation here, the first three books. Aristotle begins very systematically by defining the ultimate goal of ethics. Ethics concerns human actions, and human actions aim at some good. So in book one, Aristotle establishes that all human actions are directed to obtain some goal or end. And therefore, in order, to, in order to understand what actions are good and what actions are bad, we need to know what the ultimate goal is that is good or bad. And he determines that the ultimate goal that's proper to us, that will actually, that will actually fulfill us, that we actually desire, is happiness. And he determines that happiness is virtuous activity using reason over the course of a complete life. But since the definition of happiness involved the word virtue, in book two, we had to figure out what virtue is. And we did so by considering the notion of characteristics. And we determined that the characteristics or habits that make up virtue are characteristics or habits that result from choice and choices that we make after we reason properly. So since virtue is defined in terms of choice, and to understand happiness, we had to understand virtue. To understand virtue, we need to understand choice. And Aristotle has here argued that choice involves deliberation. It doesn't go directly upon opinion, because we can act contrary to opinion. It doesn't follow directly upon desire or wishes for outcomes, because we can wish for things that we don't have the power to accomplish. And choice does not follow or involve directly our emotions or appetites, because we can choose to act contrary to our emotions or appetites. Therefore, the one thing that choice does involve, Aristotle thinks, is deliberation. We choose after we deliberate. So therefore, because choice seems to be connected with deliberation as opposed to appetite, emotion, wish, or opinion, the next thing we need to consider in order to understand choice, and thus virtue, and thus happiness, is deliberation. So deliberation is a process of reasoning, and it concerns things that we can actually achieve. We don't deliberate about things we cannot do. Now, I can speculate about the best way to get to the moon is, but that only has any practical use, or would really be called deliberating, insofar as it might be theoretically possible for me, I'm probably too old for this, to join NASA and become an astronaut. Aristotle further notes that not only does deliberation only apply to things that we can do, but deliberation is only used, we only deliberate, in areas where it's a little uncertain how we ought to act. If there's a clear answer about how to achieve a particular end, and there's only really one option, we'll choose that option because it's clearly the only way to do it. We deliberate, he says, in matters that hold good as a general rule, but whose outcome is unpredictable, and in cases in which an indeterminate element is involved. So deliberation involves trying to figure out the best way to achieve our goals. Now, we only need to figure out the best way to achieve our goals if it's unclear what way will be most effective and what way will achieve our goals while also making us virtuous. If I can become rich by robbing banks, but robbing banks won't ultimately help me achieve happiness because one, I'm probably going to go to prison because I don't think I'd be a good bank robber, and two, it won't make me a good person because robbing banks is unjust, then I would not choose that. But if I'm not sure the best way to go as to how to become rich, should I invest in stocks and bonds? Should I hide my money under my mattress? Should I work five jobs? Should I get a degree in financial services or whatever it might be? If there's different possibilities, that's when we deliberate. Now, deliberation, as we said, concerns the best means to achieve our ends. It does not concern what ends are best. We only deliberate after we've determined what we think is the best outcome, what we think we ought to achieve. The, the act of concerning 
uh, the, determining what is the best outcome, what our ultimate good is, what happiness is, will not be a deliberation, that'll rather be a rational investigation, which is what we did earlier on and what we are engaged in now, trying to figure out what happiness consists in. Now, the way deliberation works, Aristotle says, is that we start with the end result. We presume, or we think about the end, and we work our, our way backwards by thinking, what are the necessary steps in order to achieve our goal? And we work backwards until we figure out an action that we can perform right now. And when we figure out there's an action that we can perform right now, that is the best action as part of a course of acting to achieve our goal, we will then choose to perform that action. So having talked about and determined that deliberation is a process of reasoning whereby we analyze the best way to achieve our goal that we have determined is best, Aristotle gives us a recap of his analysis, and he gives us three main points. First, man is the source of his actions. In the case of moral acting, an action is moral if you caused it. Secondly, deliberation is concerned with things that are attainable by a human action. We do not deliberate about whether or not squares can be circular. We do not deliberate about whether water is wet. We do not deliberate about whether we can get to Alpha Centauri next week. We only deliberate about things that are attainable by human action. And last, these actions about which we deliberate are means to an end. We only deliberate about actions that aim at ends beyond themselves. These are those immediate goods. They're good as means. If we are considering actions that are good in themselves, that will come prior to our deliberation because that is part of our determination as to whether those actions are good period and should be pursued at all. Having gone over these, Aristotle then gives us his definition of choice. He says that choice is a deliberate desire for things that are within our power. And we arrive at a decision, we arrive at our choice on the basis of deliberation, and then let the deliberation guide our desire. What Aristotle means by this, if we break it down, is that our choices, our choices are desires and our desires move us to act. So choice is a state or an action that we have that makes us actually perform actions, but it's a, but it, unlike an instinctual reaction, unlike instinct, which causes me to act, but without thought. So if you throw something at me, I'll put my hands up to block it. Choice is a desire that is arrived at after deliberating and, as we said, only concerns things within our power. And once we've made our choice, our action is then guided by our deliberation. That is to say, we made a plan and then our action follows the plan that we have chosen to do. Now, having said this, Aristotle then notes that we need to consider the step before deliberation namely the idea of determining what is best. Now this, we said, was the providence of wish. So let's consider now wish and the proper object of rational desire. Now unlike deliberation choice, wish does not concern the means that we use to obtain a good, but rather what are the good things that we are trying to obtain? What do we wish for? What do we want ultimately out of life? We want to be happy, right? So there is a question, though. Is the proper object of our rational desires, our wishes, merely what appears to be good to each person? Or is there an objective object of wish, something which all men desire? And then we have the further question of, is there a proper object that all men should desire? Yeah? Now, Aristotle puts it this way. Must we not admit that in an unqualified sense, and from the standpoint of truth, 
the object of wish is the good, but that for each individual it is what seems good to him. So Aristotle is no fool. He knows that people disagree about what constitutes the good life, and that each person is probably going to pursue what they individually think is good. They're going to pursue their beliefs about goodness. So the object of wish, that is to say for each individual, is whatever they think is good. Their wishes concern what they think to be good. But nonetheless, because he's a moral realist, he says that in an unqualified sense, from the standpoint of truth, there is only one proper object of wish. That is to say, there's one thing that we should wish for. And if you don't, you will not be happy. Nevertheless, it's not something that we all automatically know we ought to wish for, or naturally all do wish for with full knowledge of what it is, namely happiness. So therefore, in order to choose rightly, in order to perform voluntary actions that will achieve our end and will actually make us happy, we must first desire what is actually good, what is proper to us according to our universal and objective human nature. Because as you recall from book one, the definition of human nature is a key part of the definition of happiness. We considered happiness to be the proper function of human beings as human. Thus, Aristotle has established an objective moral system here. He says that there's a proper object that we should desire because it will fulfill us. And unless we desire that object, we won't be able to deliberate rightly because our deliberations will be aiming at the wrong target. So the most important thing in ethics is to first know not what particular actions are moral or immoral, but what the ultimate purpose of life is, what the ultimate purpose of human action is, because we cannot evaluate the morality of a particular action unless we know what that action ought to be directed towards, what our actions ought to be aiming at. So then, Aristotle concludes this examination of voluntariness by considering how we are responsible. Now he argues that each of us is responsible for our moral character. No one is born bad or born good. If you're a bad person, it's your fault. If you're a good person, well, mazel tov. It's your responsibility, or it's your fault, but it's your fault for being good, which is a weird way to say it. So he reasons in this way. The end is the object of wish, and the means to this end is the object of deliberation and choice. And because actions concerning the means involve choice, they are voluntary. Now, as we said in our previous lecture, virtues are expressed and developed by the same actions that are means to the end that we desire. So virtues are developed by actions that we perform when we are virtuous, and these actions, if they are directed towards our ultimate good, will produce virtue if directed towards the true good. And if they directed towards an end which is not the true good, they will make us vicious. Therefore, since virtue and vice depend on our choices and our ability to act or not act as is appropriate, we can say that we are responsible for our moral character. Aristotle says we must conclude that it depends on us whether we are decent or worthless individuals. If you're a bad person, you can't pass the buck and blame somebody else. So moral responsibility and owning your actions is a key part of ethics for Aristotle. But more fundamentally, owning your character. Owning your character is a key part. Aristotle then continues by talking about the fact that no one is unintentionally just or unjust. So with this in mind, Aristotle considers some excuses some people might make for why they are bad people. He might say, well, you know, look, I know I'm not the best person, but it's not really my fault. I'm just, 
I'm, I'm just kind of careless. I'm absent-minded. And he says, well, carelessness is not an excuse for being wicked. Carelessness is a habit that develops because you've chosen not to be careful. In this way, we see that injustice and self-indulgence, likewise, are voluntary. Because unjust and self-indulgent actions produce an unjust and self-indulgent character. If you perform voluntarily actions that are unjust, you are responsible for producing a habit of injustice in yourself. Likewise, if you are voluntarily doing self-indulgent actions, you choose to have a fifth bowl of ice cream after dinner, you're responsible not only for being fat, insofar as you chose to act according to your desire for ice cream, but you're also responsible for being the sort of person who, maybe, I don't know, ends up addicted to ice cream. Insofar as you choose to allow yourself to become vicious, your vices are on you. So Aristotle notes, however, there may be factors, there may be factors that are beyond our control that might hinder us. So he says people are not blamed for things they did not bring upon themselves. Now he gives an example that one who is naturally ugly is not to be blamed, but someone who becomes ugly by choosing not to take care of himself, who doesn't exercise, doesn't eat right, smokes, drinks, does drugs, and suddenly he's not looking so good, he's to blame for his bad appearance. So this does show that Aristotle recognizes nuanced cases and that it's not always clear how responsible you might be. If, for example, you were brought up in a household where your parents didn't treat you well, they didn't teach you well, there might have been abuse, to the degree that the habits that you developed as a child were not habits that you chose to acquire, but rather were things that happened because of the circumstances around you that you did not voluntarily impose on yourself, then to that degree, we would say you're not really responsible for that bad character. However, and this is important, Aristotle still thinks that because we are rational, we have the power to recognize and discern the truth to the best of our ability. And because we have the ability to discern the truth, and because the truth about what is good is so key to direct our deliberations, to direct our actions, if we recognize if we recognize that we desire goodness, we should ask what is truly good and investigate it. We are responsible up to a point insofar as even though we might have bad habits that are not our fault initially, we're responsible for recognizing that they're bad and for choosing to do something about them. So, there's one last objection that Aristotle needs to consider, and it's the relativist objection. Now, we talked about relativism in week one, but let's return to it. Aristotle presents the following argument. All men seek what appears good to them, but they have no control over how things appear to them. And the end appears different to different people. So, in contrast with the typical relativist argument, which says that there is no such thing as objective truth, there is no such thing as objective truth, and because there is no such thing as objective truth, there is no right or wrong. Therefore, as long as you're consistent with your own beliefs, you're good. Aristotle says some people, they just can't control and are not responsible for what looks good to them, be it due to addiction, be it due to genetics, be it due to cultural upbringing, whatever it may be. Some people might say that if someone grows up in a culture that's messed up, they have that person has no control over how things appear to him. And because he has no control of that, he's not responsible for his vice. And we said that Aristotle does recognize that there is some there is some uh, there's some degree to which we might excuse somebody, but that this this argument cannot be maintained. Because the objection here is saying that 
because you cannot control in any way whatsoever what appears good to you even if even if I show you what is truly good if you're to say genetically predisposed towards something bad you wouldn't be able to recognize it or accept it therefore you are not voluntarily bad you're not a bad person Aristotle says in this case if this argument holds we are not responsible for our choices because we're not responsible for what appears good to us but if no one is responsible at all for what they think is good then neither vice nor virtue is voluntary and we have no free will the only way to say that people are not responsible for their moral character is if you deny the possibility of free will and you deny our reasons ability to know what is good for human beings what is good for us as human beings these two points however Aristotle does not think stand we are able to cause and control our actions and we are able to know what human beings are and determine what is fulfilling he has done so in book one all right well thank you for watching this video lecture please uh, do the readings for the rest of the week and complete the corresponding assignments I will see you in the next lecture